Uh, our next speaker is Danish, and I'm not going to introduce him, but I'm just going to introduce his chair. Uh, last night we heard uh, Shirley Cocott say a lot about building a school for gifted children in uh, South Africa. And I thought it was very interesting because I've actually been a school leader of one of Panilla schools here in Odense, and I know a lot of the things that she thought was very similar to what was being said yesterday. So you please welcome uh, the, the founder of the Danish School for Gifted Children, Pernille Burrømer. So, in 2004, when I first founded the Gifted uh, Schools for Gifted uh, Children and worked as a principal, I met Hans Henrik for the first time. Not only was he so full of passion for his work and a very good speaker too, but he really enlightened me and the rest of the principals in the room uh, in his talking about educational systems. Being a member here of the conference committee for one and a half year, I had the chance to ask for him. So I'm very, very proud today that he's with us. And please welcome Hans Henrik Knob and give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can't work. And uh, thank you for the invitation to, to this conference. It's a, it's a great honor to be here to speak to you about these important educational matters that are so paradoxical when we analyze them. It's one, maybe the, the most highlighted problem with teaching gifted and talented is that they're good at learning in a setting that's optimized and politically aimed at being good at learning. How can that possibly become a problem? Um, of course, the answer is that human beings have many capacities, and unfortunately, this is one of them. Um, what I will do uh, today is try to give you a broad overview over uh, the field of positive psychology or some parts of positive psychology and let you know how some of the perspectives from that really bring, shed new light on educational psychology, that is my background. And uh, the reason I, I do that is that there's so much to say about it, but also that even though positive psychology that you may know from the debates uh, is sometimes controversial, there's one part of positive psychology that's almost completely consensual, where you don't have any debate really, and that is the application of positive psychology to educational psychology and to school and education. Uh, because it is so clear that well-being in its many forms promotes learning, promotes performance. It's not only a result of doing well, it's also a precondition for, for doing well. So we might as well up front insist on feeling good in school because that's the only loyal thing towards your family and your teacher and your society uh, because you otherwise wouldn't be able to do your best for them and for yourself. So, but it's, it's not happening, of course, and, and many feel that uh, school is, is really not by far as exciting as it should be. Uh, and uh, I'll try to put a perspective on that. Also, uh, the word fairness is important. Uh, by nature, we are optimized for social status. We are very focused on social status. We try to get up, uh, and we try to expand our territory, get out by nature, by evolutionary uh, disposition. And that means that we are very, very sensitive to social exclusion or Earliest, the earliest signs of social e exclusion. We are very, very sensitive uh, to criticism, much more than we should be in these uh, modern days where we're not in, in danger as we were on the savannah back then. But still, we have, it, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. And it explains, in my analysis, very much of the misgivings we have about um, school. That is created with the best intentions and still uh, create all these casualties. And when we look at the gifted and talented, it's, it's really paradoxical that they should have any problems. But it turns out, as I guess you all know, that about th three quarter of the problems that the gifted and talented have, they share with those with learning disabilities. 
things like, my teacher doesn't understand me, uh, I wish I had friends like me, uh, I wish they would accept me for what I am, and so on. The list goes on. Ten years ago, in 2005, we had a governmental task force here to try to deal with that, the issue in public school, in, in, in elementary, and secondary school, and also in higher education. Um, and a lot of has happened since then, but by far not enough. And uh, one of the objections that you've heard about also on this conference, of course, is that it has this elitist aura around it. It's, it's about the well-off taking care of the well-off, and aren't we fed up with that? Do we want this 1% controlling the 99% and all that that we know from economy. Sometimes it's kind of chunked together, the, the gifted, talented, educational philosophy is chunked together with that 1% um, thinking, and of course, that creates resistance. Uh, my approach, therefore, also, is to take a more egalitarian approach and really say that everybody, it's a human right for everyone uh, to be adequately challenged, uh, including those who are good at learning. So let me do something about it. First, a bit of theory. One basic theory I'll remind you, many of you will know this theory on self-determination by professors uh, Edward Deasy and Richard Ryan from Rochester, is that they, through almost 50 years now, have documented very, very solidly that all human flourishing also depends on three basic needs being satisfied the need for autonomy, and that means that whatever you do, uh, you're better off if you are wholehearted in it. But what if I'm in security in the airport? Well, then it's better for you if you can understand the meaning of going through security and taking most of the clothes off uh, than if you don't. But it's not autonomy. Well, it is. It is. If, if you stand behind those security measures, so it's, it's, it's voluntary. So autonomy in this term, in this understanding, it's not about uh, <clears throat> independence or egoism or selfishness or whatever. Uh, it's, it's about feeling that you can actually endorse what you're doing. You, you're not a disgrace to yourself. You're not a shame to yourself. The basic need for competence is another one. We need to develop a conviction that we are able to master our circumstances if only we put an effort into it. If we don't have that understanding, we're likely to train ourselves in helplessness, to develop learned helplessness and the habit of thinking, I'm not going to make it no matter what I'm doing. Then, of course, when talking about gifted and talented, we think that that's not an issue for them because they're so good at it. But if they're bored, if they are if they are not thriving, if they're misthriving in school, and they cannot do anything about it, they learn to be helpless in that order also. So it, this is a pervasive problem. And self-efficacy is a main research category or construct, I think, to be accepted across the board today in educational psychology and, and also in positive psychology, and also in educational research this big meta-study by John Hattie has student expectation way up here. Student expectation is pretty much what self-efficacy is about. If you believe you can, that's a great predictor of your performance. And if you don't, that's also a great predictor of your failure. So optimists and pessimists are equally right on that. Um, and then there's relatedness. Uh, nothing functions in social isolation in human life. Nothing functions in, 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 in social isolation. So we all need the color of, exp of experience and existence that we get from being loved, being recognized, being part of something, and meaning something to that part, that, that whole that we're in. If in social isolation, nothing works. The most cited living, the arguably most cited living uh, scientist, Noam Chomsky, was uh, asked a few years ago in, at the age of about 85 if he could tell us what love is now where he's so he was so wise can you tell us what love is so he got the question what is what is love and immediately he answered i don't know uh, and after a short pause he said all i know is life is empty 
without it. And we know that. That's equally relevant in school. You can be as good at math and, and sciences and language or whatever as you want. If you don't have any friends, it doesn't really count. And you know that. Imagine the teacher asking your kid at a con consultancy, um, um, Michael, how is it to be so good at math now where you don't have any friends? You know, you know there's something wrong with that teacher asking a question like that because the, the social belonging and the academic excellence go hand in hand. It's, it's not two sides, it's not different things. And I have my own little version of this where I said talent development is really easy, sort of. I'll expand on that. It simply requires meaningful substance you know, that, that you're not bowing your head to something that you don't understand and thereby ruining your integrity. You understand it. You get a good explanation for why this curriculum looks the way it does. Adequate challenge, uh, which we optimize to from by nature also, and stimulating community. And when I say we are, it's easy. It is because we come into the world as newborn, as children, optimized for exactly this. We're, we're optimized for finding meaning. We are pattern-seeking human beings that try to understand everything, including what a cloud looks like and so on, which is sometimes fantasy, but still we are meaning, pattern-seeking individuals. Uh, we seek adequate challenge, and especially through play, uh, when we're small. Uh, and it's the most natural thing in the world, and it's the most learning-rich in the world, as I will expand on also. And we're deeply social. We wouldn't get anywhere in evolution or in social life if we were not socially embedded, of course. We don't have a panzer, we don't have claws, we don't have long teeth, we don't have anything. So, through millions of years, we would be dead very early on if we were not able to take advantage of the social communities that could protect you, the only thing that could protect you. So it's no, it's no wonder that we are so sensitive to signs of social ex exclusion as we are, even though we're not uh, lethally uh, in danger today as we were then if we were socially excluded. Uh, because we haven't changed, our biology hasn't really changed since we were hunter and gatherers. And there's room for improvement. And a new report, D Denmark has a, a national study on well-being among all pupils now in two cohorts, uh, the zero to three and four to nine. And um, I have the full report here, but I only have an hour, so I'll just give you one very relevant uh, finding uh, from this survey that, that comprised about 90% of Danish pupils, representing them, them all. Uh, and um, it's from fourth to ninth grade, only one-fourth report uh, uh, often or very often being able to do something when they're bored during class. So there's this item asking, when you're bored in class, are you able to do something about it? Only one-fourth are saying yes. The reason I, I highlight that here is that this is this main giftedness and talented issue that apparently hits many children in, in school, apart from the talented and gifted also, uh, only one-fourth report what parents to these children uh, would consider acceptable. Why don't they accept, why, why shouldn't they learn to be bored? Uh, because it's unhealthy for you. Because boredom tells you that you're wasting your life. Boredom tells you you're, you're not fulfilling your, your talent. Boredom tells you indirectly that this is the kind of life you don't want to live. So get over it. You, it's not something you have to learn. Then comes the opposition and says, well, what about delayed gratification and the marshmallow test and all that? Isn't that important? Yes, but not as boredom. Then do something else. Just don't, don't just sit there for hours and hours, wait for the marshmallow. Do something with your time. Boredom, the best, I think, the best emotion theory that we have today, the best term for, or the best understanding of the function of emotions today is emotions as input. It's called emotion as input. It's like an instrument, the dashboard in a car tells you important information, but it's, it's not in itself what is the essence of experience. It's a trip in your car that's the essence of experience. The dashboard is a help. 
the same way. Boredom or anxiety and so on, it, it's, it, it's not what you live for, it's life that you live for. But boredom and anxiety are very important inputs, very important messages to you that you're in danger or that you're, you're wasting your time. Uh, and we should be able to respond to that, of course, like we respond to any other emotion, like hunger or tiredness or whatever. So let me try to give you an, an, a brief overview of the science of well-being, that is sort of the definition of positive psychology, and, and show you how, how this draws on insights from many different fields, but also stands on a 2,500 year of philosophical heritage. Uh, and the word flourishing, um, apparently uh, invented by, by uh, or coined by Arist Aristotle, is understandable. Why, why flourishing is, uh, why well, this botanical metaphor is chosen for human well-being, called flourishing, is understandable when we look at a, a broom plant like this, because it's obviously a well-functioning broom plant, and it's obviously life-confirming. It doesn't need any explanation for why this is good. It just shines and radiates in all directions why this is good. So if you, if you ex uh, think of your pupils as a broom plant, or you think of your pu pupils yourself as somebody uh, being flourishing, what, what are the basic, the basic um, mechanisms at hand here. My best um, summarizing factor anal analytically based uh, approach to this now is this, self-regulated strength-based growth. This, this plant, like any other flourishing plant, of course is a self-regulating plant. Nobody is broom planting for the broom plant. Just like nobody can learn for the learner. It, it's something the learner does itself. Uh, the brain does within the learner. It's also a strength-based plan. And the, the reason I mention that is that the notion, the ideal of doing something strength-based sometimes comes across as an educational fad, something that goes away next year, then we'll have something else. My approach is, my argument is that it, it's the complete opposite, that strength-based is what any individual within any species in all of life is actually depending on utilizing in order to survive in this world. So we all have our genome running us, which are a kind of strength, and the, the plant doesn't try to get, be, be a giraffe or something. Um, but we individuals, of course, like pupils, also have to play to their strength, in part because their best chances for success lie in this, but even more important, their best chances of having good processes, life quality, as life uh, goes on, uh, lies in this also. So it's, it's not a Pollyanna kind of ideal, get used to it, the world is harsh, and you know, it's dog eat dog out there. Well, maybe so, but this is still an ideal. And you know what, the, the more you base yourself on your strength, the better you will be at even the toughest game. And finally, it's growth. It's, it's not, it's, it's not uh, standing still, it's, it's not death, it's not um, nothing happening, it's not depression, it's growth. It's not being stuck in your life. No stuckness for a flourishing organism. Another example of the same, just to create some productive redundancy you have here, obviously strength pains based growth, self-regulated strength-based growth, and a and, and, uh, <coughs> metaphor for a good school, which I will expand in a moment. And this, then the argument comes again, well, it's fine, autonomy, and people should do what they desire, and all this uh, need-driven stuff, and so, but it's, it's a tough world out there. You have your duties, you have all these demands, uh, people are trying to get you down, bring you down, and so on. It's not so easy. And, and, and where are the ethics? Where, where are your responsibility? Why only yourself? And, and, and that's, that's, that's true. That's, that's an important argument. But none of, none of that criticism is really relevant to what I'm saying, uh, because what we find is that nothing happens in isolation, and every voluntary activity always happens within coercing and constraining conditions. So I just want to get that point across. 
here up front also, to flourish, all life, of course, must self-regulate. Your, your heart has to pump. Your brain has to function. Your nervous system has to work. But, but they're always given con constraints. You have natural laws that you cannot exceed. Uh, you have needs for eating and drinking and sleeping, and if you don't honor them, you'll die. Uh, there are political laws, there are traffic law, there's all kinds of laws that you have to co comply to. But this doesn't stand in opposition to being a voluntary autonomy, autonomous agent. It's just a framework in which the autonomous agent has to learn to, to, to be and has to learn to function in a way that you don't hurt yourself uh, uh, by accepting ways of thinking or ways of acting that are undermining your own um, well-being. So this is a system model. This is my main model that I use in my, my research now and I, that I work on, and where I try to summarize um, the main categories of well-being that positive psychology is, is built on now uh, with learning and creativity, which is relevant for this conference, of course. And um, it's based on what I was saying up front until now, that you, we accept that we're all, there's this foundation of satisfying basic needs for self-regulation um, and, and building on your strength and growing for all human beings. So my contention would be that if your pupils in your programs are experiencing this, they're, they're, they're already very well off. And you may then ask, what are the symptoms of them experiencing this? And then I would say, there are some clear symptoms that represent main research areas within positive psychology and other sciences of well-being. Um, and let me mention physical health first. A good definition, or a candidate for a definition of health, uh, is an autonomously regulating body. Health is when you get a fever, because that's necessary to get your immune system up if you're poisoned, so that you don't die of the poison. So fever is a healthy thing. It's a regulation. If you're freezing, it's good if you burn more calories, because otherwise you die from frost, and so on. So Physical health is one way, is one symptom. Another symptom is what we call positive emotions, which are these brief sensory experiences of affect that we sense when we are having a good meal, listening to a joke, enjoying a view, listening to Mozart, and so on, these brief experiences. And in, in, in the Greek terminology, these, these types of well-being are called the hedonic, kinds of well-being, the hedonic kinds of well-being, sometimes called happiness, but there's so much confusion and conflation of terms, so I'll just try to, 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 to pitch it to you here this way. It's concrete, it's here and now, you can feel it here and now, and it's brief, it can change in a minute. You can, you can go from having a good time to being a, a casualty in, in the traffic the next moment, of course. The third kind of well-being is what we call engagement. And engagement is this situation where you, over a prolonged period of time, are uh, occupied and immersed in something that is so interesting that you forget time and space and yourself and learn in the process and feel playful. Feel that you're in flow, as it's called now often. Uh, feel li like um, you're, you're Time just goes on and on, and the things that happen uh, have this characteristic of hands and minds merging into one. What your hands are doing is completely at one with what you're thinking about. You're completely there. This sounds like an exotic ideal, very far from what we're able to do as human beings. And again, I would say it's, it's, it's not, not at all an exotic ideal. We are all optimized from birth to be in exactly that situation, which is when children are playing. They are exactly in that engaged situation. <clears throat> then there's this more abstract kind of well-being, which in the Greek terminology sometimes is called a eudaimonic kind of happiness, uh, which comprises meaning, 
And meaning is this sense of being part of something much bigger than yourself. It's, it's about having a direction in life. It's, having, it's about ha having something that re you really want to achieve, a difference you really want to make uh, in life where you transcend yourself and you, 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 you are something in the bigger whole. And related to this, what we call social relations or um, relatedness, which is also more abstract in the sense that you can't see relations. You can feel them, but, but you can't really see them. And, 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 and you may reflect on what is a real relation and can they be bought for money or what, what is it? We have evidence for and against and so on. So these are different kinds of well-being that are all important for learning and if your pupils would have this basic, these basic needs fulfilled, uh, my argument would be that these would be some of the prime symptoms of that kind of life quality being there. What else? Look, uh, please note that it's all intrinsically motivated. Well-being is something you want which means that it is intrinsically motivated. It, it kind of carries its own meaning and weight. You, it, doesn't have any, it doesn't need any other legitimation. It, it, it's worth living for in itself. And this means also that if your pupils have a sense of these life qualities while being taught, they will also find life interesting. And if you find life interesting, of course, you want more life. How does that express itself? Uh, well, through two types of potential psychic energy, which we, among other, but also that, two types of potential psychic energy, which we call curiosity and the urge to act, which are complementary potentials in the sense that curiosity is about sucking the world in and understanding more and more and developing your competence and able to see and understand what's going on. And the urge to act is very much about creativity and using what you have learned in a personalized manner, in, 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 in an acceptable manner and so on, but using what you have learned. Uh, making a difference, being special, not just being a clone in the community. And I imagine your pupils do have that kind of um, state when starting class, which, of course, many of the anecdotes tell us are possible. Um, I can refer to my, my Danish colleague, uh, Paul Nissen. Some of you will know Paul Nissen. He's on the board here. Is he here? And uh, Paul has this wonderful statement of gifted and talented children who certainly are pulled out of some swamp that they're in educationally and, and giving the opportunity to really enjoy being stimulated and, and, and acting on what they really think they should be doing. These may be more or less anecdotal, but I think when reading the literature, this is what we find everywhere. Um, and if that is the case with your pupils, it's, it's just about opening the levy and, and let flourishing happen, let learning happen, let creativity happen. Again, where learning is about, about becoming more competent and creativity is about using your competence. Uh, and this is like a complementary relation. It's more dialectic than it's dichotomic. It's, and and it, this becomes very clear when we look at what is the result of this. What is the likely result of this? Well, the likely result of this, of course, is that you do learn to your optimal, uh, and you do become creative to your optimal. You don't underperform. How could you underperform when you're doing your best and really putting an effort into that? And, 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 and please note that effort is the most easy thing you can put into things. This is another deep paradox in education, that effort, making an effort, it's by far more motivating than being sloppy in your work. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, imagine, if, 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 you, if you think of situations where you're really trying to do good work, try to uh, make an effort for something, one of the things that happen is that you actually get a chance to feel good about it. It can be fun, it can be interesting, it can be sustainable psychologically in the sense that you 
get a desire to learn more because this is a nice thing that you are experiencing. While sloppy work never provides well-being. There's nothing in it for you by being sloppy. Why do some prefer sloppy work? Well, because there's something worse than having a bad time. Social stigma, social ridicule. And if, if only you get that going, you, you know, you can bully people into anything, including self-destructive thought and action. But if we are successful in this, um, we, maybe I should, since it is you, I should say that there should be a, there should be a, a, a arrow more here going back and forth because success and creativity, uh, uh, sorry, competence and creativity in these terms are actually mutually reinforcing in the sense that the more you know, the more you can use this knowledge for going far with your creative endeavors. But the other thing also happens, creativity reinforces learning in the sense that creativity creates immense memory boost. It's much easier to remember things that you use, that you need, and you, you know you, you have a use for. There's this saying called use it or lose it. it. tells us that if you use something that you have learned, you're likely to remember it. And what happens when we're creative, when we're immersed in a project is that we have this instinctive sense of needing knowledge, which means that in Danish we call it klebejan. Uh, when you're creative, klebejan means that you get glue for your memory. It's much easier to remember things if you need to remember them than if you don't. So the real need for knowledge is a very important precondition for actually remembering what the teacher said. So let's make sure they, they have a need for what we deliver. And of course, this is reinforcing processes also. So if you, you're successful in learning, you will have a desire to learn more. And if you're creative, you have, you're stimulated to do more creativity and, and so on. It's wonderful. At three points or so about this. Every one of these blue boxes deals with something that can be trained. All of this can be trained by the individual. And all of this can be promoted by the teacher and by the leadership and by the society and the culture or inhibited. So there are two sides to this. One is that the learner, can, the person, the individual can do something yourself and the surroundings can promote or inhibit this happening. Another thing is that, well, in, in, in Northern Europe, where most people are brought up in a Protestant work ethic, um, we have this saying that you, you, you have to, you have to um, work before you can enjoy. First, I, I, I don't know how it, how it is in, in English, but first you have to work and, and put an effort into saying, and then you can enjoy. This is half truth if you look at this. If this is what you perform, well then, of course, this creates some kind of enjoyment here. But the other thing is equally important. If you don't have this basic type of well-being, if you're not healthy and in good spirit, you're not likely to go very far with anything. So this comes back to the point I made initially. We may actually insist on well-being. We may insist on well-being because it's the only loyal thing towards our society and our surroundings and ourselves um, that um, is there for us. It's not a luxury to, in education to, to thrive. It's a precondition to perform. So, what can we do? What, what, um, and of course, there's a huge literature about that, but in, in, in very few points, what, what can we do as educators as leaders, as parents, as promoters of this happening to our young. Well, if we look at physical health, what psychology informs us, and this is basically psychologically driven points from the, re the psychological research, well, nutrition is important. It really matters what you eat. It matters for your mood, as you all know. We shouldn't have these glucose spikes going up and down and so on during the day. Movement is important, and not only exercise for the body uh, um, 
muscle and so on, also for the spirit. So if you do, for instance, three times aerobic exercise a week, you can expect a, a boost in your basic mood uh, equal to the best Prozac. So, you know, the, the antidepressive um, medication. Just something. Um, sleep is important. If you, if you don't sleep enough, you can be almost certain that the day after, uh, you, or the following day, you will be in a lower mood than you would otherwise. So do less and sleep more and perform better. Not, not sleep too much, but you know what I'm talking about. And then, of course, uh, take a shower. Um, what about positive emotion? What's that about? Well, the safe and secure and confident social atmosphere is important. We have very limited Mem uh, attention span, of course, and whatever goes to being afraid of your peers or being afraid of rid ridicule or humiliation and so will be subtracted from the amount of um, psychic energy that you have for concentrating on the substance. So it, it's important. And it makes life worth living, of course, that there's a good atmosphere also. Aesthetics do mean something, and sometimes you can. Uh, we, we have this saying that beautiful rooms create beautiful thoughts, and, and everybody knows that there's much truth to that. Also, also we have meta-studies showing that you can actually disregard the aesthetics, because as long as you have a very military-like kind of school where everybody is looking the same way, it doesn't really matter whether you sit in a container or a nice setting, because you're not seeing anything. Um, I'm a little harsh here, but you understand the point. And then functionality. Functionality means short waiting time. It means that the tools that you need are there, like in your hobby, in your garage, and in your workshop, and so on, that, that you don't have to wait a long time for something without getting anything out of waiting. Functionality is important. Things should be at hand when you need them. All this makes for brief, m many good brief moments during the day. How to get in flow? How to, get, how, how to be engaged in something over a prolonged period of time uh, without um, um, getting lost in something or missing the point altogether? Well, these six, these six um, uh, characteristics are the, pre the universal characteristics or preconditions for flow. This is how you organize a play, uh, if you're a child, without knowing the words, of course. This is how any sport is organized also. Any computer game complies to these principles. And any good learning situation, working setting, will also comply to these setting, including that they allow for autonomy for individuals, responsibly, but still, that the goals that are there are meaningful, they're not, they're, they're not um, uh, meaningless, that the rules are actually functioning to support that you reach your goals, they're not a heavy bureaucracy inhibiting that you reach your goals, um, that challenges are flexible so that you're not stuck in overwhelmedness or boredom, uh, that feedback is stimulating rather than humiliating so that, you, so that feedback is sustainable psychologically in the sense that you get a desire you get, prom you're, you get more, you get a desire for further feedback by the feedback you get. And concentration. If, if you can't concentrate, of course, nothing happens, um, and, and you, you won't learn much. You, and it's, it's important to understand that we have a limited attention span, and whatever we attend to will be our life. Uh, and anything that happens that you didn't attend to um, will not be a part of your life. So uh, we have to be very critical and, and, and picky with what we accept to fill our consciousness, our attention. And again, uh, it's first and foremost an individual matter to make sure that happens rather than um, um, the surroundings that tell you what your experience is. If you're reading a book, for instance, and, and somebody asks you, it, it, it tells you, this is a good experience you're having there. It doesn't really make sense. You, you know, you can. You can say that friendly-wise and so, but you can't know for sure. It's, it's only yourself uh, that is a judge there. And this sort of 
makes the first point about autonomy relate to the, the whole rest. That's a, this, the, about concentration. That, that can only be done if, if you are fully behind what's going on. Otherwise, you will lose interest very quickly. What about meaning? If your pupils say, we want, what's the meaning of this? What, um, what, what are the answers? And, and of course, there's a huge literature on that also, but I would highlight these two uh, features. Uh, on small scale, when, whenever something can be used for a purpose, and the purpose is there, nobody asked what the meaning is. It's very clear that it's meaningful if you can use whatever you hear or use your time for. Then, if something is more abstract, you need good explanations, good reasons. Like if, if you come to your, your, your pupils and you say, I think we should, uh, we should talk about ISIS, you know, Islamic State. And they may say, well, why is that? There are no cheap holidays in Syria. Well, and then you can pull out three pictures of ex-journalists having encountered um, Islamic State and talk a bit about what the difference is between a theocratic um, dictatorship and a parliamentary democracy. And then eventually many of them will say, yeah, we, we, we see it. It'll be good to know something about this so that we can prevent ending up in a dictatorship. Uh, we are very vulnerable to accepting bad reasoning. If we, and and I, I want to stress this also in, in meaning. Often in education, when we survey well-being, we don't ask. We don't ask the pupils whether they find the curriculum meaningful, because the meaningful is given by governmental statute, so the, uh, there's no questioning here. It's just do it. Okay. But we have to be aware of this fact, that if we are doing something that is meaningful, we get two life qualities with that. One is that we get drive. If you, if you understand the meaning with it, you, you know why you want to go to the mountain, you, you get an enormous drive, a motivation to move forward. Strong drive, strong willpower. The other thing you get is resilience on the way. Why is that? Because if you fall off or your daughter falls into a lake or something, or you could die trying to save her, you would any time try to save her and mobilize the resilience necessary to do that. Because you know what's the meaning of this is and what's the important thing. Maybe this is said best by, by the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who said that a person, an individual, who understands his why can tolerate almost any how. So if you know why you're doing this, you, you know you can go through fire and water. Uh, if you don't, if it's meaningless, imagine the opposite. That's really the point. Imagine you're a pupil and it's meaningless what we're doing here. You don't have the drive and you don't have the resilience. And you, you don't even have anything to look back on once it's done. And maybe I should say here also that if we look at motivation psychology today, one of the striking facts that anybody agrees on also is that there's almost nothing in life that really makes life worth living that basically is about getting as quickly as possible from A to B. Almost nothing that really makes life living is about getting it over with. And it's so clear if we look at life in its entirety. Imagine a newborn baby having this agenda, I need to get to B as quickly as possible. It's clearly not how we are born. Indeed, we are born with the opposite instinct, survival instinct. We want to push B as far away as possible. The purpose of life, thus, is not getting it over with. The purpose of life is living life. And this point actually scales down to any good experience in life, if, if you think about it. Imagine going to the movies and you have the agenda, I, I gotta get out quickly, I, I, this has to... Well, then don't go to the movies, you know. Don't even, don't, don't even bother. And when we're in school, the same thing applies. And, and that's, of course, provocative. And what about social relatedness? Well, social relatedness is about many things, but one thing I would highlight here is that uh, about support, social support is very much creating 
uh, a situation of calm and safety, but it's not in itself creating learning. Learning comes from positive social challenge. And I have made many surveys on well-being with school children in Denmark, and often we pilot those surveys with the representatives, the student representatives first, and then we may ask them, what do you think? If we ask, do you, have, do you feel good social support in your class, would that be a good item? And they all say, yeah, that was a great item. And then we ask them, what about this? I feel good, positive challenge from my, my, my pupils, my, my peers. Well, challenge is not, we, we get into a fight if we challenge one another, so better not ask about that. That's not really well-being. But this stands in direct opposition to everything we know about flourishing and interest in life. Because, and, and, and this is a kind of a subtle point, but I'll just bring it across anyway. Monotony is experience-less. If something is monotonous, you don't experience anything. Why? Because you habituate to monotony. An example from the sensory system, if I go like that on the back of my hand, I can feel that I'm striking my hand and my brain registers some kind of input. If I create a monotonous um, situation, um, information stops. There's nothing to talk about here. So there's nothing being sent to the leadership. Same thing, if you have an, a piece of paper, you draw a cross on the middle of the paper, you stare intensely on the cross for 15 seconds, you will notice that the world disappear around the cross because there's nothing happening here, no worry. Uh, there's nothing to, so you, you, you almost get blind by doing that, as it, you know, temporarily, of course. And, and this is also part of the reason why you can't tickle yourself. It's simply too predictable to work. There has to be this unpredictability that creates surprise, that creates non-monotonous experience in order to experience that something is happening. And, and this very basic understanding that we have to challenge each other, not each other, be with each other, play against each other all the time in, in order to have fun, is a very, very elementary point that is very often neglected. And this, so this is the, the summary model, and um, I will now sp spend a few minutes on just going through some of the, ba some basic points I wish I had more time for, but uh, I think you'll get it. Um, the natural way, the natural way of doing this, I hope I have argued, uh, from, from birth is actually play, children's play. This is playful learning but it's also meaningfully disciplined, playful learning. There's no anti-curriculum to playful learning, and it's, it's just to get the basics right when we want to create a living classroom with flourishing. This is my daughter 10 years ago, and she's, she's, this is dangerous, kind of, this is a python. She has her third boyfriend now, and uh, it's, it looks like that also. <laughs> My point would be then that talent development is easy. Gifted, talented, it's all easy if, because playful learning is actually this meaningful discipline. And if something is like a play, you know, it, it feels easy. What we don't often appreciate there is that when you're playing, you're optimally challenged, totally focused on the substance, immensely learning rich. Okay, then why are we not playing more? Well, we are, actually. If you, if you look at all mammal species, you will notice that the 5,500 living mammal species all play when they're young. Because the window of opportunity for learning when you're a young mammal cannot be employed any better than by playing. Imagine a philosophy where play and learning gets um, separated conceptually. And I want to read this um, uh, from uh, Peter Gray, who has written maybe the most um, recognized psychology textbook in the US, Steven Pinker's favorite Gray book for, at, at Harvard, of course, 101. Um, he says the following in American Journal in 2011. Over the past 50 years, free play with other children has declined sharply. Over the same period, anxiety, depression, suicide, feelings of helplessness, and narcissism has increased sharply in children, adolescents, and adults. 
The de decline of play has contributed to the rise of psychopathology in young people. Play functions as a major means by which children, one, develop intrinsic interests and competencies, learn how to make decisions, solve problems, exert self-control, follow rules, learn to regulate their emotions, make friends, learn to get along with others as equals, and experience joy. Through all these effects, play promotes mental health. So I elaborate on this in the following way. Play, free play seems to be the most important activity through which children acquire and strengthen personal competencies. Perseverance, seriousness, curiosity, social nuancing, uh, control of impulses, and so on. It's all fully uh, at play when children play free play because they're totally responsible for everything they do thus. During free play, children learn genuine, genuine initiative, genuine responsibility, genuine passion, genuine perseverance, genuine control of impulses, general, uh, genuine social limits, social finesse, general tolerance of risk, creativity, etc., etc. Imagine not employing the window of opportunity in the early years for that, which we are not doing over the last 60 years, because free play has declined steadily while documented melted problems have gone up. And I should mention, to be sure, correlation is still not causality, but mental illness is what you would expect if you deprave children of free play. According to Gray's research, the, there are two main reasons for free play having no place in early childhood. One is urbanization. People move into the big cities, one million a week, move into a metropolitan area, and this is a bit more dangerous and, and complex, and so, so parents are more careful to let their children play out of sight. The other reason is all the textbooks and all the self-help books and all the good advice telling you that your children should not fall behind. Now, this is not to say anything against promoting gifted and talented children. It's just to bring the point across that they, too, need to have a real good life uh, while doing so. And it's totally normal. It's what every other child should have also. And it's so paradoxical that we're not able to provide for that. Many of the best experiences in youth and adult life, like hobbies, journeys, parties, and indeed basically play-like, however structured and directed, Good scientists are often childish, playing with new ideas, trying out weird things, while remaining true to the core virtues of professional discipline, the science in the crib, having grown up, sort of. And it's a universal ideal uh, for aging. Um, maybe the leading, happy, uh, the leading aging researcher in the US today is George Valiant, and uh, we were at a, a meeting, a few years ago, and uh, somebody asked George, what is the key to happy aging? He is, he's 80, uh, and he, he smiled and said, I have three words for you. Um, play, play, and play. If you ask the Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, who, who got his prize uh, together with the post um Amos Tversky, uh, he described the playfulness of their work as a key to the genius that they found. Uh, Nils Bohr is a Danish example of some of the same and, and often is being written about it. So remember this. It is a trap. It's never going to happen, hopefully. <laughs> and I want to read this for you and then uh, leave it to, to questions. When I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life, said John Lennon. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment, and I told them they didn't understand life. Thank you very much. Okay. So, thank you very much for that very inspiring speech. So, questions. We have uh, only a few minutes, but as we did yesterday, we could take four questions. Anybody? Yes, and please wait for the microphone. 
It's on the way. And you have a question. You will be the first one then. Sorry, Hansi. Like all my life, all my childhood, my I've, um, my parents have told me that it was healthy to be bored, and now you're telling me it's not. So I have to revise my whole life, or how can I pass it on to my children? Ah, so what 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 is the pr the question precisely? What? Uh, <laughs> How can I break this terrible um, sentence that it's healthy to be bored? How and not tell my children I or my I students? So how can we break the circle of having taught our children yes. that they should learn to be bored? Yes. A, okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's going to be difficult. They're going to no. They, they'll be happy that finally <laughs> we see it. No, boredom is not something to be avoided, and it's something that's always there. Uh, moment by moment, potentially, uh, and we should recognize it when it's there, but we should not cherish it for its quality in itself, because it does not in itself make life worth living. It's important information. And I, I have to say that often when I hear people say that children need to learn to be bored, that's, that, that's not what they are saying. They're saying our children have to learn to feel their inner self and, and feel a real need before they go on with anything and use their passivity, which typically goes along with boredom also, for something, realize that passivity is getting you nowhere. I think that's what most parents, including you actually, were meaning about it. You don't want to see these children sit there with empty eyes staring out into nothingness. It was. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And the woman in the blue dress. Thank you so much. Now I know why I crossed an ocean. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Martin Seligman would be smiling about now. Um, my question comes again, what can teachers do? I've been learning a lot about neuroscience and the nervous system and I've said the curriculum is the teacher's nervous system. The teacher's nervous system. But what, as someone in a college of education, just what would you have to say for teachers? I would, I would say that we're all in it together. When we're all in a global orthodox educational structure which was created and founded 200 years ago with no information about stress or immune systems or genetic differences or anything. It's simply a disciplinary thing bringing people. It's also supporting enlightenment, of course, which has worked well in many ways. But now, where we see all this, uh, all this myth thriving in education that really is pointless, nobody benefits from a passive, disappointed learner. No, nobody has a legitimate interest in something like that happen. We may find hope in understanding that, for instance, what I've been talking about here is something that everybody can feel. I don't have to convince you that an emotion is a good thing or something. You can feel it, and if you don't feel it, you don't trust me. It's, it's very easy. There's this saying in, in communication theory that it's, it's much easier to show than to tell. It's, it's a bit difficult in educational circles, but if, if, you, if you can feel that something works, you don't ask any questions. It, it bears a meaning in itself, and that means that if we, for instance, take this one-liner, insist on well-being in, in loyalty towards your surroundings, people will be able to feel, point one, that well-being is nice, as they knew beforehand, but now it can happen in school also. And point two, if, if you're actually aware of it and account for it, you'll be able to see the boost of performance coming from that also. And if you create an evaluation culture that is primarily focused on added value, on, and that means pupils' effort, and, and secondary on their score on, on a hit list in the, in the end. You get not only uh, a better climate because it, it's more comforting, but also uh, you get the, the enormous important quality in pupils' lives that they, pre they uh, maintain a sense of control over their situation because they can control how much effort they put into something. They cannot control where they end up on, 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 a, on a rank because the others may be better even though you did your best. 
So we need to have a culture where everybody wins by everybody doing their best. And it, it's, it's collective, but it's also individual. So it, it kind of cross, it crosses a left-right political spectrum rhetoric, and it, it, it brings science uh, into the discussion also like this. And then I should probably mention, even though I guess you all know that, that also positive psychology stu uh, studies, but also others, have, have looked at performance and said, what explains performance? So, what explains a good grade in school, a good score for a pupil? And, of course, there are many, there are many good things, uh, many explanations, but there are two big ones. I think you know that, talent and effort, right? And if you're normally gifted or above, uh, two-thirds of the variance, two-thirds of the explanation for a good grade in math will be your effort. So this is really good news for almost all students, pupils. Thank you. So we had one question here in front. And we have time for a short, not only a short Excuse question, me. but, but oh, a okay. short answer. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you that many of the things you've said are very troubling to me and contradictory to what we heard last night about our needs for the 21st century. We talked about teaching um, people not only to collaborate, but to compete. We, we uh, Carol Dweck's work on effort and hard work, um, don't fit with the messages of parents who say, yes, you need to follow your passions and you need to have happiness, because we need also to have resilience. Mm. And if children are prepared only for happiness, when they're disappointed or when they lose, mm. they will quit. Yeah. And that will say, we're not playing. Yeah. So, um, although I, I always thought I was very positivistic in my approach, I, I there are some yeah. very contra contradictory issues. And of course, I get one hour tonight to respond, yeah. but <laughs> I know your time is late. Thank you for that important question. And it is, it is true that we are in competition at all levels. I was mentioning that by nature, we have this Darwinistic tendency to try to get up and, and expand our territory, so we are competitive species. And, and, and this can be employed political, where everybody competes with everyone, and in economy, where everybody competes with everyone, which is the macrosphere. If you look at the news reporting, uh, economy and pol pol politics will be 80% of, of of what is being talked about, 80% of, of the public consciousness. So com competitiveness is, is everywhere. I realize that. What I'm saying then is that if we want to turn this inhumane selection mechanism around to be what every politician is actually saying they want, a school for all, we need to employ the fun of competitiveness in a humane way where everybody wins by everybody doing their best. I know this sounds a, li a little too golden to be realistic, but I, I see no other way. And there's an enormous um, legitimacy in doing so, because if you ask all parents if they would accept their child to be hurt and destroyed by com competition in school, uh, of even forcing them to this, they would take their child away immediately. Nobody will accept that. And it's not, there's no political legitimacy to do that either. But it's, it's realistic. So my, my argument is really, if I had more time, I could talk about flow, for instance, or sport or something, where you do compete, but, but you, it's sustainable competition in the sense that everybody wins by merely participating. And everybody uh, preserves the desire to actually um, come back. I sometimes compare that to Olympic spirit, an Olympic spirit of competition where everybody wins by participating and everybody wants to join in four years again. It's, I, I can't see what we can do otherwise because we are, if, if you just rank children from best to worst, we know from negativity bias studies that it hurts much more at the bottom than it, it does good in the, at the top and society breaks in two in this bipolar uh, division, which we're already seeing in many places now. So education is extremely important in mediating that, I would say. Thank you.
And perhaps you should ask yourself, is an unhappy child um, willing to learn at all? That's a big question here too, I think. So I want to thank you, Hans Henrik, so much from all my heart to be here with us today. It was very interesting and I'm very proud that you came. Thank you so much. Thank we you. have a little present for you and I think uh, it will be good for your health, both of them. <laughs> thank you.